climate change doesn't live on an island, we're all impacted by it. It's really not and shouldn't be a political issue. Climate One has ensured that indeed many, many different parties have seats at the table. Every mainstream religion has a mandate to care for creation. We all have a moral responsibility to the future. The way parents have a responsibility for their children. We all have children or relatives who are very young. Do we not want their world to be good too? Do we not see clearly that what we are doing is not sustainable? And if you do see that, and you continue to deny it for some political reasons, then this is a travesty. Kids are growing up now and there's absolutely no question on whether climate change is real, whether climate change is happening, and the question now instead is what should we do about it? The future of environmental activism is motivating young people to become civically engaged. Now more than ever, we need to come together as a culture and a society to address this really important issue. I am a supreme optimist. I do believe that we can transform ourselves. I do believe that we have the energy, ability, and courage somewhere inside of all of us to do what has to be done. Thanks for joining us for this live stream conversation with Rick Ridgway on climbing, conservation, and capitalism. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who inhabited these unceded lands for 10,000 years. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. And today you can submit your questions for this live stream in the comments section. I'm delighted to welcome Rick Ridgway to Climate One from the Commonwealth Club. Rick is recognized as one of the world's foremost mountaineers and is the former vice president of public engagement at Patagonia. Rick, welcome to Climate One. Great to be here, Greg. Thank and you. Congratulations on your book, lived, uh, Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map. I think it's uh, published today. So. Yeah, today is the official release date. Well, thanks for joining us on this special day. So your latest book, Life Lived Wild, chronicles decades of your adventures at the edge of the map. What has been the appeal for you in going where others have not? Well, it started, uh, you know, as things like this usually do, I suppose, with uh, a lot of people that uh, get passionate and obsessive about a single thing at an early age. And uh, one of the earliest influences for me was when I was 14 years old and uh, got a copy of the National Geographic in the mailbox with the article about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. Mm. Uh, and in it was a picture of Jim Whittaker, the first American to climb Everest, uh, standing on the summit, holding his ice axe up with hurricane winds blowing the American and National Geographic flags tied to the axe handle. And I saw that and it disconnected with me. And I said, I, I want to be that guy. Uh, that's how it started. Cool. And early in the book, you relate a conversation you had with Nima Norbu, one of the, your guides on the American Bicentennial Everest expedition. She says that if Sherpas could make the same money some other way, they wouldn't go on these dangerous trips, especially if they could be home with wives and children. She goes on to say that Sherpas think Americans on this expedition are kind of silly. Maybe, quote, maybe you people have too much money and you don't know how to spend it. So how do you think about that in terms of, did you think about privilege back in those days? Um, I did. And that uh, story is the first chapter of, of, of the book. Um, after I saw that article in National Geographic, I uh, tried to teach myself how to climb. Uh, that set off the warning buzzer in my mother's uh, pater uh, maternal instincts, and she sent me to Outward Bound School as a high school graduation present, and, and I was hooked. So I started going on mountaineering trips, and eventually, even in my mid-20s, that led to an invitation to join the first American ascent, uh, the, the second American attempt to on Mount Everest, following the first ascent in the National Geographic article that had inspired me to start. So there I was in my mid-20s on the highest mountain in the world, and uh, I was convinced I was going to make it to the top. You know, I just wanted it so bad. Uh, and then at about the 26,000 foot level, uh, I got sick. And I got an infection in my lungs, and, and that was it. I was, I was knocked down, and, and I didn't make the top, but my climbing partner did. And I had to reconcile that. I had to figure out, uh, you know, I had to look inside why I was so disappointed. And it was a mirror. Looking back at myself, I could see that the answer to the question was 
uh, I was disappointed because it was Everest and it was all about my ego and, and not about what I could spiritually get out of an experience like that. And, and, and that became a, a considerable you know, introspection. And, and, and that's why I chose to open the book that way. I thought it was a good way to really challenge this idea that most people have about mountaineers that you know, they probably think it's all about reaching the top. But what I learned over my lifetime is, is that's not the real goal. And did your ego uh, get in the way of having empathy for the Sherpas and the people serving you in that journey and others in that journey? Uh, no, no it, I don't think it, it interfered with that. But what it did uh, reduce was probably what I could have taken from that experience if I would have been more engaged in actually the process uh, and, and less focused just on the top. And I wouldn't have been as disappointed not, not making the summit because I would have understood more deeply what I could get from the process instead of just getting on the summit. And, and that's a, a path that, um, or a realization that took me a considerable amount of my life to, to really figure out. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege to risk your life for pleasure, uh, for some people anyways. And you also say that in mountaineering and in business, it's not about taking risks, but managing risks. Say more about that. Well, uh, my experiences as a mountaineer have taught me a lot of things that I have taken from the high altitudes back down to my life at sea level. And, mm. and part of that life is uh, my business life. So uh, with other uh, colleagues in business, uh, mentors, uh, people like Yvonne Schoenard and, and Doug Tompkins, who have been my climbing partners, you know, we've really taken the, what we've learned on, on the mountains and, and we've applied it to to the businesses that we've been involved in. And I worked at Patagonia for 15 years with uh, Yvonne. And one of the key insights was understanding really how to manage risk and how to uh, take that back into the business life and understand that you, know, you don't want to really take a risk on a climb that uh, is going to kill you. <laughs> and in business, you don't want to take risks that are going to possibly jeopardize the, the health of the business. So, you know, there, there were things like that that we brought back to our sea level life and, and applied to it. Uh, but I think the biggest lesson back taken from the mountains back to the way we ran the businesses was what I just told you about the process, about uh, finally learning that it's not about the summit, but it's the footsteps to get there. And you can apply that to business too. And that you can find the real meaning out of the process of running the business instead of some end game of just trying to create wealth for you and especially if it's just your shareholders instead of your stakeholders. And, and that's probably the most important lesson that we've taken out of the time we've spent in the mountains, especially the time we've spent in nature and applied back to business. That it's not just about the business creating wealth, but it's about creating good for the whole system, for all the stakeholders. And that's certainly the way that we ran Patagonia over the years. Uh, that's why it was in business, to be an agent for environmental and conservation protection. And we'll drill into that in a little bit. Um, Yvonne Chouinard and Doug Tompkins became your mentors as you became this ac accidental businessman. Uh, you're all skeptical of business and capitalism. You know, why did you continue building a company that was selling consumer goods? And how did you reconcile that with your interest in conservation? Yeah, it, it was a, a, a real dilemma. Uh, I'm trying to figure out whether we were part of the problem or part of the solution. Because we were making... Uh, a lot of stuff, <laughs> and, and, and we realized right in the beginning that stuff has an impact, that no matter how hard you work to reduce the impact of the stuff you're making, uh, it still has a, a really measurable impact. Um, and wrestling with that was the reason we ran that now famous ad uh, back in uh, 2011 on Black Friday, uh, the kickoff to the shopping frenzy of the Christmas season in the New York Times with a photograph of one of our best-selling jackets and above it the headline, don't buy this jacket, because we wanted to shock people to go into the copy of that ad and where we explain that no matter how hard we had tried to make that jacket with no unnecessary harm, it still had used nearly 200 liters of water or gallons to make it. It had still left behind uh, 20 pounds of 
carbon dioxide emissions, it had still created two thirds of its own weight in waste. And we were wrestling with that dilemma at Patagonia, trying to figure out, well, should we continue to grow ourselves? Should we try to figure out how to redefine capitalism so that we could have a, a company that was in stasis that would still survive without growing? <clears throat> and finally, we realized that there was an answer in the emerging science of food and fiber production uh, around using regenerative protocols. So here's the connection. <clears throat> uh, if you can create food and fiber with regenerative farming, then that creates healthy soils which pull carbon out of the air and store it back in the ground. And that was an enormous aha for us because here was an opportunity to make more of our products out of natural fibers that were grown regeneratively because then if we could succeed in making products out of fibers uh, that were creating healthy soil that were drawing carbon out of the air and put it in the ground, then that shirt that you're wearing right now could actually represent carbon atoms that have been sequestered back in the ground. So maybe making consumer goods, making more stuff could be done with more good than harm. So that a net positive, and we've heard some companies recently say this, because there's typically companies have said, we want to be less bad, less bad. And so this is flipping that and going further and say, we want to be net positive, social and environmental benefit as a company, rather than just minimizing harm. Do you think the company overall achieved that? Well, it's a, it's a work in progress. That's the, that's the vision, that's the, the path. Yeah, it, it's a work in progress. We're supporting small whole farmers in India to try to uh, develop the protocols for growing cotton regeneratively so that the uh, cotton will produce healthy soils that sequester carbon. And uh, we're making, uh, we're um, sourcing our wool from uh, ranches that uh, are, uh, that, that follow the same regenerative protocols and are also creating uh, soil health. So it's a, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process. And we've got into the food business now at Patagonia too, for the same reason. I mean, we're in the food business now with a line of um, dried fruit bars and bison jerky. We have seafood products, and um, now we have beer, even Patagonia beer. Uh, and it's all made with regenerative ingredients. And that's the reason that we got into the business, uh, was that it is an um, enormous potential solution to climate change, partial solution. Right, and a vehicle for good. And yet the yeah. irony is that that don't buy this jacket campaign increased sales of the jacket. Yeah, I know. Uh, ad Week <clears throat> came out with a little notice after that ad came out, and they said, the coolest, most ingenious use of reverse psychology we've ever seen in advertising. And they actually thought that's what we were doing. Could you imagine they were, you know, they just assumed by default. The cynicism, cynic, cynical that motive? Was, that we were cynical. Mm -hmm. Oh, I never got over that, actually. It was <laughs> yeah, and it's a privately owned corporation. You know, yeah. Patagonia, led by uh, the Chouinard family, you know, has, in your words, you know, the luxury to do whatever we want. And that means not being beholden to shareholders yet. So uh, your thoughts there on whether uh, that, that's good, you know, uh, that you don't have that shareholder pressure. Uh, but these days, a lot of shareholder pressure, are you know, shareholders are pressing companies to be more sustainable. Yeah, that's a big, uh, that, therein lies an enormous uh, uh, hope for us. Uh, that, that, that could be the biggest driver to really change business, much more uh, potentially than just the uh, influence of a company like Patagonia. Right. So we're talking with uh, discussing climbing conservation and capitalism with Rick Ridgway. He's former vice president of public engagement at Patagonia, and his new memoir is Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map. Um, your identity is as a mountaineer, and that's how you see yourself and others see you. What's the impact on your identity of receding glaciers and mountains that are now dirt rather than covered with beautiful snow? One, one thing spending uh, uh, time in nature, where in the beginning of my book, I, I say that I calculated I've spent over f five years living in tents, and uh, most of that was uh, tents pitched in, in really remote wild areas. Um, you know, really deep into nature, where uh, I learned over the years and decades to pay attention to nature, to really observe shifts and changes. And as a consequence of that, um, I was able to see firsthand a ringside seat, as it were, 
uh, to uh, the retreat of glaciers, to the shift in the patterns of migrating birds, um, I've actually been able to witness it, to witness Geolog the changes which used to be measured in geologic time happening in, in human time. Mm. Uh, and that mm -hmm. is astounding to consider that. Um, it started in the 1980s. I mean, I remember following uh, James Hansen's testimony to, uh, to Congress, as you probably did yourself, uh, Greg. And then uh, probably we also share the impact that uh, Bill McKibben has had on us. I saw him on your video at the beginning of this. And mm -hmm. uh, his book, End of Nature, was a big impact on on me, uh, because suddenly I realized that um, that as Bill argued in the book, um, instead of nature willing the evolution of the world, we're in the driver's seat willing nature. Hence the title, the end of nature. It had it had a big impact on me. Um, and then one of the expeditions I was fortunate to uh, participate in was a. Uh, a traverse of uh, Antarctica on dog sleds. And it started on the Antarctic Peninsula uh, on a feature called the Larsen Ice Shelf, where for a couple of weeks we dog mushed uh, in the Antarctic winter down this ice shelf. Uh, and I remember one night in the tent uh, hearing the ice crack. And I was used to that because I slept on glaciers where ice is <laughs> cracking all the time. But this was a different kind of crack. <laughs> this was really shallow and sharp. Um, and uh, a few years later, uh, sitting back at home in, here in California, uh, looking at the newspaper, uh, I saw this article about um, a iceberg uh, the size of the state of Rhode Island yeah. breaking off uh. the Larsen ice shelf right where I had been mm. and floating out to sea. Geologic time happening in human time. And that really drove it home for me. I'm, I'm getting shivers because I think that is my earliest climate conscious moment. I vividly remember seeing Lice Larson, I think it was Shelf B, that, you know, there's Larson Shelf and a little thumbnail photo in the New York Times before I founded Climate One and saying, oh, that can't be good. And that was bef my recollection is that was before Inconvenient Truth, et cetera. But for you to actually be there drives it home really how powerful that is. You know, in, in 2015, uh, you were kayaking in Southern Chile with Yvonne Chouinard and North Face founder Doug Tompkins. High waves capsized both of your kayaks, plunging you into 40 degree water. What happened next? Well, it was actually just uh, Doug and I in a double, Doug and okay. me in a, in a double kayak. Um, there were uh, four, uh, there were, we had four boats. We had, um, uh, Doug and I were in a double and, uh, Two others were in um, a double, and then uh, there was a couple of uh, Yvonne and another in, in single kayaks. And we were um, going along the remote coastline of an enormous lake in southern Chile called uh, General Carrera. And uh, the water was extremely cold, but the conditions were near perfect for the first two days. Uh, and then on the third day, a, a wind blew up, and we took the day off. Uh, and the next morning, uh, it seemed calm, but we launched uh, our boats uh, and we headed across a bay towards a point when the wind picked up again uh, very strongly. And this time it was crosswise to our direction. And Doug and I had been having problems with the rudder in our boat malfunctioning, uh, and we were having increasing difficulties keeping the um, kayak pointed uh, down the waves instead of counter to the waves. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we had this crosswind. Well, the others got ahead of us because we were falling behind. And then uh, uh, the boat uh, turned uh, partly sideways on a wave that tipped us. Uh, and we got capsized into this really cold water. And we both knew we were in big trouble. And we tried to right the boat several times and get back in it and paddle, but we kept getting capsized. And then we tried to swim towards the point, and um, I thought I was dead. Uh, the water was actually 39 degrees, and you can't last very long in water that cold. Uh, so the second time in my life where uh, the first time was in an avalanche where I've uh, had the seconds and minutes uh, to really consider my life and what I thought was probably my imminent death. But uh, our friends did reappear uh, and started towing us uh, towards the shoreline. 
and I was unconscious by the time uh, they got me ashore. Uh, and it took them a little longer to get Doug ashore. Uh, and by that time, uh, he was dead. Mm -hmm. He didn't make it. And we all know on some level that we're going to die. Uh, and we spend a lot of time pushing that fact aside. Uh, and you talk about how Western culture hasn't always been that way and that how looking at death, you've had a couple of real close encounters with it, can um, you know, change our relationship with, with nature. So talk about that, how death and nature. Yeah, um, in that avalanche that I was in with Yvonne and two other close friends uh, in uh, a remote part of Tibet, uh, one of my closest friends uh, died in, in my arms uh, and we buried him on the side of the mountain. And uh, we were in that avalanche for a full minute. And in, for a full minute, I thought I was, I was dead. And then I had, years later, this uh, similar second experience with Doug's death, similar in that I also, at the same time, assumed I was going to die. So I went through that a couple times. Uh, and then just two years ago, uh, my wife of nearly 40 years died uh, from cancer. And from those experiences, but also rooted in this life, outdoors, um, close to nature, I've been able to get into my bones and internalize uh, the, the, the knowledge, the deep knowledge that, that all life is framed by death. And life doesn't exist without death. The Buddhist and impermanence of things, yeah. It is, it, it is a Buddhist way of, of looking at it. It is. Uh, so then I, and I, I credit the time I've spent outside in nature with that realization in a deep way to integrate it inside of me. I think for me anyway, probably more than I ever could have done meditating in a monastery were I to have been a Buddhist, <laughs> but it's worked for me. And what I've learned from that, which I think has given me resilience to deal with the death of, of my friends and, and my wife most recently, um, is this uh, commitment to not turn your back on the pain of losing somebody you love and that you're close to, or maybe even possibly losing your own life, but to confront it, uh, to acknowledge it every day, um, to let it in instead of trying to keep it out. And it's the opposite of this American idea of closure, which I don't uh, believe is a very, very healthy response to death, but rather we should all, in my opinion, be doing the opposite of that. And I've, I've been able to do that, I think. I feel that I'm uh, moving forward uh, after the death of my wife uh, quite well uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a healthy way. I, I, and, and, and that has been a way, and, and, and that's been a process that has included, um, in a sense, embracing her death. So if I'm hearing you, you're l learning from nature is allowing you to look at death, different, accept death as part of nature, and that's informing, uh, not running from the pain of death and loss, whether it's a loved one or of a beautiful place, and to in embrace that as, to accept that, if not embrace it. Yeah, it is, to, to accept it. And, and, that, and that comes from spending, for me, from spending a lot of time in, in nature. Um, even this morning, uh, I had an early start this morning, <laughs> but in the dawn hours, uh, there was a, 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 a death cry from an acorn woodpecker in a tree just outside my bedroom window. And it, in the middle of the night, it might have been taken out by an owl or something, and it didn't die right away. And I heard its, its panic and its own death, and I thought of the panic I felt uh, at first when I've come close to dying and some of these near-death experiences I've had that then evolved into an acceptance of it. So I know that even in nature, we are all, all of us, all, all humans, all animal life is designed to do everything we can to avoid death. <clears throat> but watching death in nature is a way to understand its integrated part of our lives. 
One of Doug Tompkins' legacies is the conservation organization, Tompkins Conservation, a private nonprofit organization uh, he founded with his wife, Christine Tompkins, the first uh, CEO of Patagonia. The group has preserved more than 14 million acres in Chile and Argentina through a, an approach known as rewilding. Some indigenous observers say that rewilding is aligned with indigenous principles, but the movement has historically been non-indigenous, that unintentionally uh, marginalizes indigenous voices. Do you think that's a fair critique of rewilding? Well, it, 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 it bears up, but uh, like most uh, critiques like that, uh, there's a lot more nuance even than what you just uh, suggested. Um, you know, first, by the way, uh, Chris has had another conservation victory a couple weeks ago, so the toll acreage is getting close to 18 million acres now. Wow, that's a lot. It, it, that's a huge amount. But you know, this theme of, um, the, uh, of indigenous cultures as uh, stewards of um, nature is a topic that I do address in, in my book. And, and that, to me, is a topic that is very, very nuanced. Uh, but I am firmly uh, of the belief uh, that the protection of uh, natural areas uh, in the world, in the main, is better done in the hands of indigenous people than it is in, with, with Western cultures. And as a, as a partial solution to climate change, Greg, uh, and I know that's the overarching topic of our talk here, um, the conservation of nature is uh, an essential pillar in uh, the basket of solutions that all of us need to address to achieve, the, or to keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. Uh, because uh, keeping areas natural, of course, uh, allows them to operate naturally, and part of that operation is carbon sequestration, as you know, uh, and most of your listeners do. So um, I work with groups, I'm working with one organization called One Earth Right Now, which is really advocating the scaling of protected areas as a climate change solution and is advocating for the, the management of those protected areas to be in the main under uh, the guidance of indigenous uh, peoples that, that live there. Now at the same time in my book, and I know I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this, um, I suggest that uh, you can't just assume uh, that any indigenous culture or uh, certainly an, any individual from an indigenous culture is going to be a natural steward of the land, but it varies. And we all have to keep our eyes wide open to the fact that, in my opinion, um, you know, one of the things that we human beings have uh, taken with us in our diaspora across the planet out of Africa is a tendency to exploit uh, the wild animals and our brethren wildlife that, that's around us. And, and I posit in my book that when given the opportunity, uh, combined with the technology, uh, even indigenous peoples uh, very often will uh, take uh, advantage of the wildlife in their area and drive it sometimes into the caves of oblivion. And there's a, a lot of historical um, you know, evidence to suggest that. I mean, when the Maoris showed up in New Zealand, they took out the moa birds. When the Aborigines first got to Australia, um, much of the megafaunal marsupials uh, were driven to extinction. Uh, there's strong evidence that when human beings first arrived in great numbers here in North America, uh, they drove uh, the meg 80 percent of the megafauna in North America went extinct within uh, most of it within 500 years of our uh, arrival. Um, so we have this tendency, but we also have the ability to overcome that tendency. So um, I don't hold any indigenous peoples to fault uh, uh, that aren't necessarily good stewards, and I've been in company of people like that, but I've been in the company of far more of them who are terrific stewards, and they're the ones that should be in charge of the additional protection of the, of the natural areas that we're going to have to do to keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. So that 8 to million acres that was bought by rich people from the global north, is that turned over to an indigenous stewardship? Uh, part of it is. Um, you know, the, in most of those areas in the very southern part of South America, the indigenous people have been extirpated from those uh, most mm. of those lands. But there is one big park, the biggest of all of them that Tompkins uh, created, Kehuascar, down in the uh, very southern part of Chile and just north of the Straits of Magellan, uh, that is uh, going, it, it will be uh, managed by uh, the indigenous people in that area. 
You expressed admiration for E.O.S. Wilson's concept of half Earth, setting aside half of the planet for nature. Does that mean keeping people out? No, uh, it has in the past, but that was the Western concept of protected areas. It came out of uh, mostly the way uh, the British set up um, national parks in the early part of the 20th century, right through the middle. But uh, but now, if you can, it, it's an it's a it's an unsustainable. Uh, uh, strategy. It just doesn't work long term. Um, and a far better solution is to uh, create protected areas, as I said, under the management of indigenous people, when they are committed to managing those lands uh, in a long term balance with wildlife. And, and again, they're the best shot we all have of achieving that goal. Patagonia mobilized against the Trump administration's efforts to shrink Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, both a, with a lawsuit and a PR campaign that replaced its usual homepage with a black screen and a text that read, the president stole your land. The idea of stolen land is, is fraught given, you know, how uh, a lot of national parks are based on stolen land. So, so how much, um, what was the outcome of that? And did Patagonia collaborate with indigenous people in that Bears Ears campaign? Yes, with several tribes, actually, uh, at the table with them and the NGOs that were working with them uh, on that. And, you know, Greg, you said earlier in our conversation that uh, you quoted Yvonne as saying, you know, we're a private company, and that means we get to do what we want. <laughs> and that's a good example of doing what you want, isn't it? Uh, a publicly traded company could probably not get away with going out on a political limb like we like we did uh, with that one. And that you know, there was a, part of that campaign was to move the uh, outdoor industry's big trade show from Utah to Colorado, which it, which happened. What was the outcome? What do you think was that? Um, what was the outcome of that Bears Ears campaign? Well, that was a, a tool in 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 the, in the toolbox. Uh, it was to. Uh, it was the idea of uh, getting the um, organizing the outdoor industry, uh, aligning the outdoor industry uh, to threaten uh, the uh, state of Utah that hosted in Salt Lake City uh, our annual uh, industry trade show every year to move the trade show uh, if the governor didn't do something about protecting bear's ears. And he didn't do anything about protecting bear's ears. And... Uh, you know, under our leadership, uh, we got the outdoor industry to uh, come through with its threat, and we moved the show to Denver. It's gone. Uh, millions of dollars a year in lost revenue for uh, the city and the state of Utah. And any, is there any, any uh, statements from uh, Salt Lake or others about the, the loss of that? Well, <laughs> no, I, I think it's, it's, it's over. That's it. They had their chance. Uh, Rick Ridgway is recognized as one of the world's foremost mountaineers and is the former vice president of public engagement at Patagonia. His new memoir is Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map. Um, there's something of a paradox in the inherent in the outdoor industry itself. I mean, how do you resolve the tension between encouraging people to get outdoors so they have a stake in wanting to protect wilderness and that lead to potentially trampling it? You know, the national parks have seen during COVID have seen almost an overwhelming number of people which are straining the parks yet is that a good thing bad thing how do you see that well we need more parks that would be uh, the solution i would i would advocate and we don't need to have less people going to fewer parks we need just the opposite mm -hmm. uh, because it is that time in nature as i said early greg um, that it, it, it's that time in nature that teaches us uh, so much uh, that can enrich our lives. It's not just a place of solace, but it's certainly that. But, but it's, a, it's a place where we can learn in a deep way how we humans are part of nature, how we fit into the web of life. And we can fall in love with nature. And only when you fall in love with nature, you're going to be really committed to saving nature. So uh, if we uh, want to really get the earth to uh, half earth, uh, to where uh, half of the earth is protected, uh, which we've actually validated with the best science done before the, up to now is going to be a super important uh, goal to keep the earth to 1.5 degrees. But if we're going to get there, we're going to have to have a lot more people in love with nature, advocating for the protection of nature and pressuring uh, their representatives and, and, and politicians to create more protected areas. That's the solution. It's not in restricting uh, access, but rather doing just the opposite. And looking at uh, extinction, resource uh, constraints, climate change, you know, the root cause is too many people 
buying too much stuff. So how do we get at that? Yeah, um, and and that's something I learned doing uh, the research uh, for that ad, uh, the don't buy this jacket ad. Uh, and, and, and more than that, it's what I learned from Doug Tompkins. Uh, Doug was a deep ecologist. Uh, deep ecology is the philosophy of um, understanding deeply how human beings are just the part of the web of life in nature. And through that understanding, uh, committing to respect all of a life on Earth and all wildlife. Uh, and Doug was early into that philosophy through a Norwegian named Arne Ness, and also through his engagement with a group called the Club of Rome. And they were a group of macroeconomists that you probably know, know about. You're nodding your head, uh, understandably, who, you know, as you'll recall, uh, in the 70s, uh, started to really understand uh, the source of the impact of human beings on the planet, uh, measured not just by the number of people on the planet, but more importantly, by the amount of resources those people were using uh, from a planet that has a limited capacity to provide those resources for all of its human activities. And, and that's the problem. It's, it is too many people, but the real problem is too many people using too much stuff. And that, and that circle, see how that links right back to uh, the wrestling match we had in Patagonia about uh, whether we're going to continue to grow, uh, the origins of that... Um, of that uh, ad, uh, don't buy this jacket. And there was an accompanying uh, essay in our catalog that year uh, that I wrote called The Elephant in the Room. Um, and it was about this very topic uh, that we're talking about right now and, and trying to challenge all of us to think about it because it's really uh, a direct challenge to uh, capitalism as is. Like you can't have uh, an, econ an economic system based on annual compounded growth right. without eventually getting to the cliff and going over. It just won't work long term. We're, we're trapped in this, this, this growth paradigm because uh, companies are judged by that you know, compounded quarterly annual growth. And yet when that growth stops, uh, the economy collapses, people lose their jobs, people are hurt, uh, donations to nonprofits go down, uh, and yet we're trapped. And nobody's, nobody knows how to get out of the trap yet. Uh, Doug Tompkins referred to it as a predicament uh, rather than a crisis because he said crises, you know, people rally people to find solutions, and predicaments are a little more difficult. And, and this is our greatest uh, predicament. And that's what I tried to explain in the essay, and it didn't offer a solution because nobody has a solution to offer. Like, we just all got to get together or to figure this out. Growing the different kinds of things or valuing yeah. differently. And the idea was just to see if we could get people to think a little differently, to start challenging themselves. And I wondered whether we were effective. And a few months after that article came out, I was in Washington for an event at the World Wildlife Fund, their 50th anniversary, and there was a lot of, you know, uh, important people there. <laughs> and uh, in the reception, I was introduced to the new uh, president of the World Bank. And he shook my hand, and um, then he turned to the next person, you know, and shook their hand. And I was just standing there. And then he stopped, and he turned back to me. He said, did you say you were from Patagonia? And I said, yeah. He says, did you guys write that article in your catalog called the 11th uh, you know, hour, and, um, or the elephant in the room, excuse me? And I said, yeah. And he says, I had that co article photocopied and I sent it to every vice president in the World Bank and I said, we got to start talking about this. So I, we got the conversation going. But still... And now people are talking about degrowth, which yeah. is very controversial, the idea of anti-growth or ungrowth, and that's kind of... Yeah, that, that's a, a topic for an, another day. But, you know, how, how do you think we should address the climate crisis? What's your prescription? If growth is this underlying problem that no one really has an answer for, what do we do about climate? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, I'm, I'm working with a group, uh, One Earth, right now that has funded the science to um, try and determine uh, if scaling renewable energy and scaling the conservation of protected areas and scaling the con conversion of food and fiber production to regenerative protocols could keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. And uh, the science that uh, it, we're nearing the completion of the science and the, uh, and the answer is really encouraging because it's a yes. 
it, it's a yes that we can do that. And if we regenerative could fiber scaling food and fiber, food regenerative food and fiber, regenerative um, and, and and regenerative food and fiber, scaling renewables and conservation. Yeah, yeah, and and we've and we started to. And we funded the science to figure out how much in each of those three areas we need to do to keep the plant to 1.5 degrees. And we're presenting uh, our um, uh, scientific conclusions uh, at Glasgow uh, in a couple weeks. So, the, the, and, and the cool thing is, these are all solutions that are already exist. You know, you don't have to come up with some giant carbon scrubber to, you know, clean the air. And you don't have to launch off into space to try to, you know, populate Mars. Companies are tripping all over themselves, declaring goals of net zero carbon emissions. Some people look at the absence of strong policy, look to companies to, to carry the ball forward on climate. Should we trust corporations to be part of climate solutions? Um, well, we should all be, uh, you know, we should all be, uh, being dubious is, is, a, is, is, a, is a good position, being skeptical, but not cynical. There's, a, you know, that core difference between being a skeptic and a, and a cynic. But skepticism is good when you're trying to um, uh, parse whether uh, uh, any company's claims to sustainability are, are legitimate or not. But in, increasingly, they really are. Uh, and, and it's because the individuals running these big companies uh, really are starting to understand uh, the threat of climate change to their businesses. And it's even going deeper than that. I, in my position at Patagonia, had the good fortune to meet many of these people, um, uh, CEOs running the biggest companies in the world. Uh, and sometimes I get to go out you know, camping with them uh, around the fire where uh, you know, their corporate speak fades away and you really learn what they're about. And what I learned with many of these people is that um, the big change comes at home. Uh, and the big change for so many of them uh, is at the dinner table. Often daughters. When, when their kids look at them and say, what are you doing about this, dad or mom? And it was fascinating to hear so many of these high-level executives reference that as one of the drivers uh, for their own commitments. But what, was, what is important in my comment here Greg, is that, is that, is that these commitments from them are serious, and they really, so many of them are really concerned about this. But then they are limited in their own actions just by the structures of capitalism that we've been talking about, by the responsibilities, fiduciary responsibilities they uh, have managing their companies for their shareholders. Uh, so, you know, I've, when I think about this, as you start to think about it more deeply, then you start to realize that it's really up to us. It's up to us who are the people buying all the stuff or using the services that these companies make, uh, that we're really in, in the driver's seat on this. Because the more we demand uh, from those companies of um, uh, re reductions uh, in environmental impact and increases in social justice, uh, the more they're going to have the freedom to do what so many of them already want to do now. Uh, because if they don't, they're going to be irresponsible to their duty of fiduciary responsibility to the company because they're going to start losing sales. Yeah, it's, it's self-preservation. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke, uh, and Patagonia is an out, iconic outdoor brand, and it also is rather white. You know, it sells high-quality, high-priced products. It's been a couple years since you've been there uh, in your role as VP. I spoke to one former Patagonia employee uh, today who said, under the new CEO, Ryan Gellert, the company is making a commitment to the optics of racial inclusion. It gives to organizations led by BIPOC leaders, but that giving can be a crutch that hobbles deeper cultural change that is hard and climate one is has similar struggles with our equity inclusion for sure um, so I'm curious uh, about the broader shift to deep inclusion uh, which this person says is not yet visible at Patagonia your reflections on that well uh, again I've it's been two years since I retired from the company and the company still isn't back on its campus yet it's not gonna uh, return to its campus until um, February or March of this coming year uh, but uh, I know through the contact with my former colleagues and with Ryan, he's a, a personal friend of mine uh, as well, that the, the, the commitment is there. It, it's as deep as it can get. But it is such an intractable problem. Um, 
with Patagonia in particular, the, if you think through the, the real problem, it goes upstream all the way to needing to figure out how society can inspire more people of color and BIPOC people to get into nature, to get into the outdoors, just as this has been the theme of our talk here, if there's any one thing we've been talking about more than the other, it is the benefits from getting outdoors. And, and, and the company needs more people connected to nature that have it in their soul that they can hire as employees because that connection to nature is so fundamental to so many of the positions uh, in Patagonia to help achieve the company's you know, real goals of being an agent of environmental protection. So it's a conundrum. Uh, and, and it's a conundrum that's not going to, in my own prediction, is it's, it's going to take a lot of time to solve this. And, it's, and we're talking about quite a few years and decades to really find the shifts, the deep shifts in our society that need to happen uh, to give a company like Patagonia um, the pipeline uh, that they need of uh, bright young people coming uh, from very diverse origins into the company. Yeah, a lot of people of color don't have access to parks or nature, and those who do are sometimes, I uh, remember we talked to one uh, uh, women's black hiking group, black women's hiking group in, in Denver, and when they went out to the parks, they were treated as like, whoa, what are you doing here? They felt uncomfortable, like like they were out of place. So their access to nature is a problem, and then when people have access, how they're treated and viewed in nature mm -hmm. is also a problem. Um, you've said that many social justice issues are rooted in environmental degradation. What are some illustrations of that? Well, uh, go back all the way to the AIDS crisis uh, and, you know, trace the uh, origins of that into, uh, into the, um, the bushmeat trade in Central Africa. Mm. Um, I think uh, even though it seems to be no clear evidence of uh, the precise origins of uh, COVID, but, uh, the, uh, you know, a zoonotic transmission is the most likely answer to, to that question. So that so many of our social issues and challenges uh, have uh, roots uh, in environmental degradation. Uh, and that is one of the reasons that Patagonia has really focused on environmental protection uh, you know, as its reason for being. Uh, and certainly it is committed to social justice issues and supporting and funding uh, organizations that are building social justice. Um, but in the main, it's really been committed to uh, environmental protection f for, for that reason. Um, but it also, uh, you know, it has been, as I said, uh, even from the beginning, there are some social justice issues that it has addressed directly. Uh, right from the beginning, it uh, supported, supported uh, abortion rights. Um, one of my favorite episodes in the company's history was when uh, the company was picketed um, by uh, a um, anti-abortion group uh, that uh, put picketeers in front of all of its stores. Uh, and then somebody in the company, I can't remember who it was, came up with the idea that they asked all the store managers to go out and uh, count the number of uh, picketeers in front of each store. And then it announced that for everyone it was giving another uh, $500 or $1,000 to Planned Parenthood. And suddenly everybody disappeared and the, <laughs> the protest was... Uh, was over. But um, another social justice issue that uh, Patagonia has supported right from the very beginning of the company in the early 70s uh, is uh, family uh, and child care support for employees. Uh, and uh, my wife and uh, Yvonne's wife, Melinda, uh, co-founded uh, the company's uh, daycare center. Um, and it has grown into not a babysitting center, but one of the world's great child development centers uh, that there is. And, and we've shown uh, how a company can make a commitment like that and still be handsomely profitable in the double digits. And to not do it, there's no excuse. Uh, and the deeper I looked into that topic and the more I learned about it, uh, the more I began to realize how essentially important that is to us as a society. If there's any single thing we need to scale in the category of social justice, you could argue that's it. Because early child development scientists, especially at Harvard over the years, have been able to measure the kinds of activities that maximize neural development in early 
childhood. And those neural developments are responsible for the emotional intelligence of uh, an individual, as well as their intellectual intelligence through their lives. Uh, and as I reviewed from these scientists all the activities that they had isolated that optimized neural development, I was astounded to see that every single one was reflected in the programs that we had developed instinctually at Patagonia. Every single one. And so, as Yvonne says, if you really think about it, the most important product that we make at Patagonia are our kids that come out of that program. Mm. We have a question from the audience live stream. Uh, Roberta asks, please reflect on philanthropy's stunning lack of support for solutions to the climate crisis. Well, Roberta, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think, isn't it between 2 and 4% of all philanthropic dollars go to environmental causes? Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. Um, what to do about it? Well, you know, I am with this. I, I mentioned, Roberta, that I'm with this One Earth group. You should check it out because now that we've got the science done, we're shifting uh, our focus uh, to, um, to uh, scaling philanthropy for climate change solutions. Uh, and uh, we just need to get the word out. Uh, I mean, I'm doing as much preaching as I can. <laughs> and I'm trying to support and work with groups that are, that are, that are doing that. Um, I probably had three or four conversations today on that very topic, Roberta, and, um, and I, you know, we'll get there, but it's, uh, you know, one, one bite at a time. What would you like your legacy to be? Well, gosh, you know, I, uh, I don't know if I could roll it up into a single thing, uh, but, you know, one of the people who helped me write the book who uh, helped me think about the deep editing part, who was with me on one of my adventures, uh, Candace Davenport. Candace challenged me to try to figure out uh, when I was rewriting the book, or actually before I did it, after I'd finished the first draft, she challenged me to figure out you know, what the spine of my own life was. She said, you, you tell me, where did you start and, and where did you end up? And I had to think about that. It took me a couple of weeks. <laughs> and eventually I landed on this realization that I started off really focused on the sports and the goals and the summit, you know, and, and the adventure with my friends, like the first story in the book, the Everest story, where we started our conversation. And then over the course of my life, it became not about the sports, but about protecting the place where we did the sports. Uh, so I suppose if there's any legacy it's that I would love to have, it's just I might be the guy that did everything he could to protect what's left of our wild and single home planet. It's about the journey, not reaching the top. I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team for making this ha happen. Adam, Arnov, Ariana, Brad, Kelly, and Tyler, they are an awesome team. On Climate One today, we've been discussing climbing, conservation, and capitalism with Rick Ridgway. His new memoir is Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and depressing. It also can be exciting and interesting. So please help us get Get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help open up the climate conversation. So thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.